Hello, um, this is Priya Natarajan, the current director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities. I am utterly delighted to invite you all to a fantastic talk today as uh, that's part of our Mapping as Knowing um, lecture series that's been ongoing for a couple of years. And uh, the title of our talk today is Mapping a Polycentric History of Renaissance Sound. And our speaker is Professor Victor Coelho. And uh, before we start and I give uh, a fitting introduction to Victor, I would uh, first like to thank our benefactors, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, um, who I think are in attendance this afternoon. They have supported a host of uh, interdisciplinary activities at Yale and uh, the Frankie program in science and the humanities is one of the flagship uh, uh, programs that they have supported. And uh, we are really um, benefiting from uh, their generosity. So I also want to remind everyone uh, that we are recording this event uh, as per usual now, and that all participants will therefore have to have their videos muted for the duration of the talk. And please uh, feel free to submit your questions at any time in the Q&A feature. Uh, we will um, tackle them at the end of the talk and uh, uh, Dr. Tykamp uh, or I will read them out for the speaker at the end of the talk. So um, our wonderful speaker today is um, one of a preeminent musicologist who also happens to be a performer, Victor Coelho. He's the professor of music and director of the Center for Early Music Studies at Boston University. He specializes in 16th and 17th century Italian music as well as popular music. His areas of research include Renaissance and Baroque instrumental styles, popular music, interdisciplinary approaches, and cross-cultural perspectives. As a specialist on popular music, he's interested in blues, rock history, improvisation, and performance more generally and broadly, and appears regularly in digital and print media. As of 2017, Victor is also president of the Saturday Club, uh, founded by Ralph Waldo Emerson in Boston in 1855, and that is where I had the pleasure and the honor of meeting him first. He has held several visiting appointments um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and Cornell University. He was also a visiting professor at uh, Villa Tati in Florence, and he also taught at the University of Calgary, where he was named a university professor. And uh, prior to um, taking up as the director of the Early Music Studies Center at BU, he was the uh, associate provost for undergraduate education. And he was also the principal author of the university's one BU report on undergraduate education. So as you can see, he has several important commitments, both to music, to pedagogy and um, academia in general. He's the author of many uh, books um, that include Instrumentalists and Renaissance Culture, uh, published by Cambridge, Music and Science in the Age of Galileo, which is an absolutely fascinating book, uh, The Manuscript Sources of 17th Century Italian Lute Music, uh, and The Cambridge Companion to the Guitar, Cambridge Companion to the Rolling Stones, he is the lutenist and co-director of the early music group Il Furioso, and his recordings appear on the Stradivarius and Toccata classic labels. He tours regularly as a blues guitarist uh, with the Rooster Blues Band. So without much further ado, I would like to turn the, um, the podium over, the virtual podium over. I wish you could be here, Victor, in person. So, but we are delighted regardless. Um, and uh, let me turn over to Victor to, uh, for his talk, Mapping a Polycentric History of Renaissance Sound. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, and thank you, Ty. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we had started this um, conversation about appearing on the series in 2020 and in March, 2020, when I was supposed to come, uh, that was when everyone, everything locked down. Um, and then next year they, they wondered whether I would come for a Zoom meeting, a Zoom talk. And I said, well, I'd like to bring an instrument or two. So it doesn't really work on Zoom. So um, then a few months ago, Priya uh, wrote and Ty wrote said, well, we're, you know, you can come live now and we can offer you dinner and come on the train. And I said, that's great. I'll, I, I accept. 
then two days later, they said, no, no, we can't have any visitors. But by that time, I'd already committed. So I just want to show how wily they are really at the Frankie Center. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to be here <laughs> regardless of whether it's Zoom. And I figured out a way that we can hear some music as well. I'm going to share the screen and we can get going. <clears throat> The mapping of a metropolitan center and its outlying periphery is both geographically real and historically construed. And the associations implied by these terms have been highly influential in the writing of both art and music histories of the Renaissance. At its most influential level, the terms have been deployed in historical accounts to control the borders of the field, to make decisions about what to admit and what to omit, and to provide a systematic accounting of history one that is fundamentally narrated from the center, often through qualitative comparisons with the so-called periphery. In a famous statement by the British art historian, Kenneth Clark, the center was the place for the creation of art, leading to that style becoming the dominant one. It is metropolitan at its center, but as it began to spread out to the periphery, it becomes more provincial. In short, a style does not develop universally over a region. It is the metropole, a single unit that stimulates its progression. This view was a point of departure for two highly influential articles by the Italian historians, Carlo Ginzburg and Enrico Castelnuovo, who did not see a predictable transmission of style from the center to the periphery, but rather the emergence of a power dynamic between the two areas in which the so-called retardedness, this is their word, of the periphery is a rejection of innovation and resistance to the center. In the field of Renaissance musicology, the notion of center and periphery has essentially guided the manner in which we map music history from the early 15th century to around 1600. It is a story of courtly centers of patronage like Ferrara or ecclesiastical institutions like the Vatican, rarely venturing further out into domestic music, the provinces or cities in the Veneto not named Venice or ones in Lombardy not named Milan. This model has effectively subordinated entire repertories, even urban ones like urban instrumental music. It has been used to ensure the primacy of notated so-called permanent works over improvisational so-called evanescent pieces, even though improvisation was one of the central techniques used to teach composition in the 15th and 16th centuries. And the center periphery model has also been used to prioritize certain regions of activity most notably courtly and urban ecclesiastical cultures. In this talk, I will suggest a revision to the notion of center and periphery by offering a new map of Renaissance music history based on the concept of polycentricity in which many centers can operate simultaneously, characterized by both conformity as well as individual and local styles, both written and unwritten, vocal or instrumental. I will focus on three case studies. The first is on the 16th century Dutch composer Clemens Nonpapa in order to show how the dominant center periphery model in Renaissance musicology has affected the reception of his work. I will then move to a case study about instrumental music, which provides an excellent model for a polycentric approach. And in my third example, I will suggest how a polycentric approach can even be influential in editorial work through the example of a new complete edition of the works of the 16th century lutenist Francesco da Milano that I've recently begun. The Renaissance composer Jacobus Clemens, known by his contemporaries as Clemens non Papa, in other words, Clemens not the Pope, as if anyone would have mistaken him on the street as the reigning Pope Clement VII Medici, was born in the Netherlands around 1515 and became one of the best known and most influential composers of the 16th century but his music is barely known today, even to specialists of the period. Clemens is barely given a name check in the standard histories of, of re or reference works. It is rare as well to hear his music performed or recorded outside of a, few, of a few pieces, even by musicians who specialize in this period and try to explore the many uncharted areas of the 16th century repertoire. Clemens's contemporaries did not see it this way, however. And this is an important consideration that should push us to revise the manner in which we map our Renaissance music histories. He composed
composed an astonishing amount in every major genre of Renaissance music, mass, motet, French chanson, and in compliance with the Reformation, he composed over 100 psalm settings in Dutch. His music seizes vividly on the texts he chose in order to create soundscapes of drama and depth. In addition, his work was arranged repeatedly by instrumentalists, lutenists and wind bands mostly, who not only extended his fame all the way to the end of the 16th century by their many versions, mainly for lute, of his vocal music, but also dispersed his music for a rainbow of different classes of musicians, civic wind bands, lutenists, vihuelas, these are uh, lutenists in Spain played a similar instrument, keyboard players, professionals and amateurs throughout Europe. So here is a composer who achieved considerable fame in his day, but of whose vast musical output numbering over 500 works, there's only faint familiarity by Renaissance musicologists and performers outside of a few dozen pieces. Then there is the problem of transmission. His music survives in many formats, printed and manuscript, manuscript sources, in Dutch, Latin, and French, in many different types of notation. And we must consider not only the pieces that he wrote himself, but also the hundreds of arrangements made of his music by other musicians, which introduce one of the central blind spots of Renaissance musicology that I will return to later. In short, his considerable output has yet to receive systematic and consistent attention. And overlooking, that would be inconceivable in art history for a painter that was so prolific, popular, and whose work remained in the rotation for decades. Nevertheless, one wonders how Clemens, whose works were standards on the hit parade of the 16th century, is a mere dot, a gas station icon plotted on the accepted map of Renaissance music. There are several reasons for this. The first is a conventional but increasingly problematic map-oriented history of Renaissance music. <clears throat> In this account, the central musical language of the Renaissance develops from about 1420 to around 1477 with comp composers born and musically trained in what was then Northern Burgundy and what is now the area comprising Northern France and Southern Belgium. This musical language, its genres, and its compositional practices were then transmitted south over the Alps through the circulation of manuscripts, but more importantly, by the recruitment of many of these Burgundian composers by Italian patrons to cities like Milan, Ferrara, Florence, Rome, and to some degree, Venice. In these mostly ducal cities, led by a ruling family, considerable economic resources were devoted to this recruitment of Northern composers and singers, the assembling of choirs, the training of musicians, the production of manuscripts, and for the benefits normally provided to those elite Burgundian musicians now in their employ, a salary, lodging, a horse, wine, wheat, and grain, and very often a generous pension. Few of these composers remained in Italy for good and benefiting from the fierce competition among patrons for their musical services, most of these made periodic returns to the North. They accepted positions along the way and added more landmarks to the historical map as they personally transmitted their music along their travel routes and composed new works that were often aligned with local musical traditions or honored particular patrons. The travels of Josquin des Pays easily the most famous composer of this period and the first one to achieve international fame, offers a case in point. Chosquin is born in 1450 up here in Northern France. <clears throat> By 1477, we find him in Aix-en-Provence working for the Duke René of Anjou. Um, in 1484, we find him working for the Sforza Dukes in Milan. There's a reference to him working in Hungary in 1485, a reference that is quite persuasive actually. In 1489, he accepts a position with the papal court. He returns to France working for Louis XII in Paris. In 1503, we find him in the court of the Este Court in Ferrara. And in 15, 
From 1504 to 1521, he returns to close to his birthplace in Condé, northern France, um, where he remained until his death. But even then, he was directing the circulation of his manuscripts throughout Europe um, and almost had a kind of individual uh, manuscript production uh, organization. But this gives you a good idea of the types of travels of a famous composer in Italy many times, but then finally um, other positions as well. With Italian courts now acknowledged as the main musical centers in the 16th century, the North retreats into the musicological periphery, carrying Clemens with it. Clemens was born somewhere in Flanders, and even though hardly any biographical information survives, he does not seem to have ventured far from home, unlike many of his remarkable contemporaries. Letters suggest that he became un unemployable because he was often, or even mostly, drunk. And he seems to have lurched from job to job. And maybe this is why he's known as, as Clemens on Papa, perhaps after you know, he was drinking, he put on papal clothing and, and walked down the street from tavern to tavern. Uh, from beginning with a position in Bruges, he bounced around several smaller cities. But he was successful in the world of publishing music and writing works that had immediate and lasting appeal in French, Latin, and Dutch. In addition to the way that the musical, musicological historical mapping cramped Clemens's place in music history, a second reason is the result of another kind of mapping, one that involves time, chronology, and the notion of progress. An unfortunate but durable musicological narrative of 16th century musical progress places Clemens historically within a distinct group the so-called post joscan quote unquote, composers, sentencing him to a transitional period of music history that was characterized not by innovation and craft, but by playing to the demands of the commercial market during this first boom age of printing, and by an extended formalistic application of the Renaissance contrapuntal technique of what's called pervasive imitation. Following, but never succeeding, Josquin, um, this group of so-called post joscan composers generally appear as a lost generation. So Clemens is born in 1510, between 1510 and 1515. Josquin dies in 1521. But following Josquin's death, he becomes more famous than ever. And um, we have this Josquin afterglow. It continues well into the 1560s in which um, Josquin's catalog of works increases exponentially, mostly by misattributions or people wanting to place their music under the name of Josquin. But because of Josquin's enormous popularity during this period, the composers who were contemporary with this period were placed by musicologists in what's called the post Josquin period. So they exist with the, in the time of the same Josquin afterglow. Clemens dies in 1555, but that is by no means when Clemens's music also came to an end. In the 1560s, the next great as far as musicology is concerned, because the composer after Josquin was Palestrina, and Palestrina dominates this age of the 1560s. And again, it further cramps Clemens's career within this post-Josquin uh, uh, post generation. But Clemens's, the arrangements of Clemens's music reach a peak um, starting you know, almost 10 years after his death and lasting for another 20, uh, 20 years. There's an enormous amount of, their, of uh, arrangements of Clemens as uh, instrumentalists contemporize his music for the last few decades of the 16th century. So Clemens was essentially a, a, a part of a lost generation who essentially kept the seat warm for the great Counter-Reformation composers, Palestrina and Lassus. The aesthetic quality of Clemens's output became and remains grossly undervalued in this pervasive and discontinuous historical narrative. One that only took into account his sacred music, not the larger impact his music had through printing and as a source for the arrangements of other, by other musicians. As an example, one does not need to look any further than the discussion of Clemens in Gustav Reese's Music in the Renaissance of 1954 and subsequently revised in 1959 the foundational text about Renaissance music history in English, equal in importance to Frederick Hart's book on Italian Renaissance art. Ries discusses Clemens in a post Josquin chapter, tellingly subtitled Richefort and some lesser men, a group that includes Clemens. 
Ries drew the map of Renaissance music into two large geographical areas. The first focused on the central musical language of the 15th and 16th centuries, geographically positioned exclusively in Burgundy and Italy. The second, which he called music of other lands, lumped together everything and everybody else in England, Spain, Germany, and Eastern Europe. Ries's division of history reminds us of Saul Steinberg's famous 1976 New Yorker cartoon of the way New Yorkers view their city against the rest of the world. The notions of central and peripheral are clearly embedded here, both with Ries and Steinberg, as well as the problems of this division. Major composers that we recognize, like Victoria, Tallis, Byrd, and Dowland, are all extracurricular to Ries's core language, despite their connections, however brief, to the center. Chronologically, the Renaissance is also divided by Ries into two further periods. The early Renaissance, beginning in the early years of the 15th century, and the late Renaissance, extending through the 16th century and to the early years of the 17th. Ries offers a substantial and often detailed discussion of Clemens's music, more so than in any other Renaissance music history to date. But his placing of Clemens in the long wake of post Josquin followers created for the composer a subordinate position that has both endured and shaped the historical narrative of the period. In another much more recent text on Renaissance music by the Ries student, Alan Atlas, which is on the screen, a remarkable book, oh, this is not on the screen, it's not, I don't have that, a remarkable book in many ways that is full of insights. He even wonders whether we should call Clemens, Clemens's period the no-name generation. One of the most eminent musicologists of the period, Richard Taruskin, in a rare act of compliance with other existing musicological opinion, also hangs Clemens in the post Josquin closet. Clemens illustrates how the history, geography, and travel of Renaissance music need to be scrutinized and aligned more closely. Clemens's life runs contrary to what we've accepted about Renaissance music history, the center and the periphery, the traditional patterns of influence and transmission, basically the conventional geomatics of history. He did not travel far from his home and he was not part of the Burgundian Italian map. He was therefore excluded from consideration. He came after Josquin and before Palestrina and remained in an area that was not deemed progressive as a musicological focus turned to Italy. In order to show how inaccurate this, is, this assessment is of Clemens, let us look at the wide geographic dispersion of one of his songs. Not the song itself in its original version for voices, but by the instrumental arrangements of this piece made by other musicians of the 16th century. The first one appearing in print in 1545, um, the, first, the song appears first in 1545 and the arrangements reveal the long popularity of this work and how this music got into the hands of many different types of players, themselves creating arrangements for yet other audiences throughout Europe. This is from a manuscript in Cambrai, uh, which contains chansons, French chansons, by a number of, of composers. You see Giselin here, and um, Claudin, and Richafort, and then right in the box, you'll see Clemens non papa. <clears throat> Entitled Je prends en grès, the song is one of his most famous. Um, the beautiful handling of texts um, and the syntactical connections between text rhythms and musical rhythms. Um, it's not surprising that Je prends anglais, first published in 1543, durably survived in the hit parade for another half century, um, due in large part to the many arrangements that were made in French tablature, Italian tablature, German lute tablature, citern tablature, and for keyboard, harp, organ, and vihuela. This on the screen is um, the first uh, lute arrangement of this piece, Je prends en gré, um, from, uh, um, from Leuven. And uh, it's an it's a arrangement in French lute tablature. 
These instrumental versions are essentially translations of an original text or translations of an original musical text. And like any translation, they point at new target audiences. They arrive at new geographical destinations. And because these arrangements are purely instrumental, that is they expunge the original French text, they are able to cross cultural and linguistic divides throughout Europe. Here's a transmission of the song, Je prends anglais, using the same map. The original was published in 1539 as a vocal piece. But by 1545, uh, 1547, um, we get this uh, pu first publication for lute. Uh, and the publisher, Falaise, not only publishes it in 1547, he publishes it again in 52, and then nine years later in 63, and then again in 71, and again in 82, basically every 10 years, he's coming out with this song. This gives you an idea of the demand that Falaise thought this song, um, uh, this, this song had in his time. <clears throat> in 1547, we find a, uh, a version coming out in Trent, Trento in Italy by another lutenist named Simon Ginster. 1556, this song is published in Frankfurt. In 1557, in Jaén, in Spain. 1562, in Trieste, by another lutenist, a blind lutenist from, um, from Puglia who settled in Trieste named Giacomo Gorzanis. In 1572, Strasbourg is published. 1576, back to Spain in Valladolid. 1577, surprisingly, it took took a long time to get to 1577 to be published in Venice, mainly because Venice's um, printing presses were mostly publishing um, Italian madrigals. In 1578, we have, a, uh, we have it published for a Spanish lute in Madrid. And 1583, we have the last um, version in the 16th century printed, I'm not even talking about what might've existed in manuscript in Nuremberg. Even though all these instrumental arrangements are different, ranging from highly ornamented and flamboyant designs to literal reproductions of the musical text's original song, these versions dispel the standard musicological notion that Clemens's original vocal piece in French is the central source. With these instrumental versions, most of them made years after Clemens's death, toiling in peripheral outposts off the main grid. On the contrary, these arrangements map a wide polycentric geography of Clemens' song, one that allows for a multifocal and egalitarian view of the work across international boundaries. They extend the distance that a work can travel from its point of origin, from its composition as a vocal piece to a transcription into other regional notations, leading to an adaptation of the original work, and finally a new performance destined for different audiences in diverse geographical locations. To conclude this first case study, <clears throat> confronting Clemens's brilliant music from various musicological, literary, uh, historical, geographical, and even performance perspectives force us, forces us to question the hierarchy and priority that underlies the conventional geographic boundaries of Renaissance music. It offers the chance to scrutinize such notions as so-called central and peripheral traditions and source types greater and lesser composers, quote unquote, singular versus plural modes of performance and the relationship between original works and their adaptations. <clears throat> this leads me directly into my second case study, which I've already hinted at. That is one major reason for the exclusion of Clemens from the narrative of Renaissance music is that instrumental arrangements of his work no matter how clearly they reveal the wide international dissemination of music, as we have just seen, simply don't count. Instrumental adaptations expand the map, but because instrumental music was a transitory and highly volatile repertory, much of it improvised, before the 16th century, virtually all of it was either improvised or memorized, led to its neglect in modern historical scholarship. Primacy has always been given to notated vocal music, but this neglect would have seemed unthinkable for those who experienced the soundscape of the time. The reality is that any history of this music will need to develop a wide angled rather than the narrowly focused view we have used until now to include the contributions of players that were neither committed exclusively to notation nor bound to an authorized style of text or style of performance. 
Renaissance instrumental music moves across international and linguistic boundaries. It is the product of both autonomous composition and arrangements of other pieces, often resulting in many versions of the same work. At the textual level, the derivative versions made by many types of musicians confront the critical and philological methods that have generally blueprinted how Renaissance music history has been studied. Thus, in examining this music, one must resist the temptation to prioritize pieces and particular versions, since so many of them are tightly interwoven with culture and function across class. We must remember how much of the vocal music of this period was arranged by instrumentalists and popularized in notated instrumental versions. For many listeners of the Renaissance, these instrumental arrangements were both the initial and most frequent contact of, say, Josquin's music, much more than for those who heard his music during restricted services in courtly chapels. In addition, through their use of many well-known dance tunes or songs and their frequent roles as musicians hired by the city, instrumentalists also played a practical role in the geography of the city, trumpets sounding their instruments when the gates of the city opened and closed, playing for civic processions, announcing visitors, and the like. Returning to the Steinberg drawing, it shows the, tradi it shows the traditional perspective of Renaissance scholarship, where the foreground represents vocal music cultivated at the institutional level, whether court or cathedral, followed by everything else in the distance. Instrumental music permits us to create a more detailed polycentric map of Renaissance music so that we can see exactly what is on the other side. We are aware of the enormous expenses courtly chapels needed to maintain a choir, a scriptorium, and for the training of musicians. But what about the music that was heard everywhere else? Nuremberg and Augsburg, the largest and most important cities in Southern Germany, but only half the size of say Bologna, supported groups of maybe four musicians who played for the city. A reminder that the urban centers of Italy were consistently much larger than those of the North and replete with funding for music. Although the bulk of archival data about musicians is concerned mostly with details of compensation rather than what they actually played, it remains difficult to produce anything like a pie chart showing the relative expenditures of a town like Nuremberg on music. However, for a small city like Winsheim, we can estimate that instrumental music absorbed nearly 20% of the city's disposable yearly budget, which is considerable. These smaller cities also tell us about the social rank of musicians, their origins, and their personal geography. For example, many musicians from Augsburg and Nuremberg found lucrative careers in Florence and Ferrara. Some came from very small villages. The records of Augsburg between 14 and 50, 1450 and 1500 indicate that several musicians engaged by the city during that time were from places that must have had tiny populations, 200 or less in several cases. Schrottenbach, a remarkable case is that of the minuscule lower Bavarian town of Schrottenbach near Augsburg, which has a modern day population of only just over 300, and was probably distinctly smaller in the 15th century. This was the home of the Rauch family of musicians and instrument makers. In 1473, Klaus Rauch provided the city of Augsburg with three pipers. At this time, Schrottenbach was such an obscure place that the Augsburg accountants and scribes felt it necessary to take the extremely unusual step of describing the location in relation to its neighboring city when they listed the payment. Paid four gulden to Klaus Rauch in Schrottenbach, which is two miles from Kempton. <laughs> and Kempton itself was one of the smallest of the imperial city. These are just a few entertaining examples from the archives, but the point is that instrumental music provides a more detailed, inclusive, and frankly more accurate modern map of Renaissance music, in which roads clearly lead to other roads. And we see a more detailed network of influences, backgrounds, and types of musicians, contexts, and the, even the artisanal infrastructure of music. My final case study um, dealing with the ideal goal of arriving at a polycentric map of Renaissance music involves a current editorial project about the most important, important lutenist of the 16th century, Francesco da Milano. One of the many lutenists, uh, one of the many lutenists whose birthplace on the musical map is embedded in his professional name, Francesco Canova of Milan. Similarly, there is Marco of Aquila, Alberto of Ripa, Perino the Florentine, Giovanni Maria of Crema, 
Lorenzo of Pavia, Anibale, the Paduan, and so on. Here I will briefly introduce how the polycentric, um, how the polycentric model, which does not subordinate the periphery to the center, can incorporate the individual, the regional, and even the idiosyncr idiosyncrasies of performance into the edition. Francesco, the only musician to share Michelangelo's epithet of the divine, il divino, uh, I guess Bette Midler would be the third, was one of the most highly esteemed musicians of the 16th century and the most influential and important lutenist of the Renaissance. Flourishing during a period when the musical establishments of most Italian courts were dominated by Northerners, as we have noted earlier, Francesco was the first Italian born musician of the Renaissance to achieve truly international fame. His music circulated widely in Europe through prints, anthologies, and manuscripts. And by the beginning of the 17th century, his works had achieved a classic status, withstanding the dramatic changes in musical style and modifications to the instrument itself that had rendered most of the 16th century lute repertory obsolete. His music contained, continued to appear in English and continental sources a century after his death. Making an edition of Francesco's music, and this would be the second, is notoriously complicated because of the plurality of source types and different regional types of notation, authorized prints, anthologies, student pedagogical books, Florentine sources, Neapolitan sources, Roman sources, English sources, posthumous sources, incomplete sources, unreadable sources, pieces copied from a print, pieces copied from memory, truncated pieces, ornamented pieces, pieces not clearly by Francesco, but no, pieces clearly not by Francesco, but attributed to him, anonymous pieces that nevertheless pass the test stylistically um, to attribute them to Francesco, etc. The sheer number of versions that exist for just a single piece can introduce dozens of complex issues regarding authenticity, particularly among the 70 or so pieces that appeared after his death. And of the pieces for which we are relatively secure by Francesco, which version does one use? The Neapolitan version that contains lengthy ornamented passages and unusual dissonances? Or the more conservative, but also more balanced Venetian version? An attempt at a complete edition was completed in 1970, which result, resulted in approximately 125 compositions attributed to Francesco, of which only 51 pieces appeared during his lifetime. Without reviewing the merits, but more importantly, the deficiencies of this edition that have made it imperative to do a new one, suffice it to say that it was a product of the rigid editorial philosophy at Harvard during the late 1960s, in which choices about what version to include or exclude in an edition were made by adopting the central peripheral template. Central sources being those that were printed, even if they contained works of dubious authorship, and there were many, and manuscripts of elite pedigree, generally copied by a single scribe. Peripheral ones, like those copied by students, 17th century sources, and prints like the Neapolitan one I just described were, um, were not used, even if they contained superior readings. In this edition, I will employ a polycentric approach essentially advocating for the use of many different types of sources and benefiting from the digital format of the edition that will allow this. When pieces have multiple versions that contain significant variants, they will all be included as a way to redraw and expand the map of, of to include who actually played Francesca music, Francesca's music and to avoid the trappings of the traditional center um, and periphery model. This means that not only are cultural, regional, chronological, and textual differences validated by their inclusion. The variants document something that I believe is critical to this project. They reveal different performances of the work that took place over time and space, and how players incorporated their individual musical and technical abilities across a wide geographical spectrum. I thought we would hear one piece by Francesco. I was going to, if I was, this was live, live, I was going to come in and play a piece, but on Zoom, I, I do have a recording of Francesco uh, from a source that was used. Um, it's a, it's a, an important source um, uh, that's called the Siena Loot Book, even though it, it is now housed in The Hague. And this is the, it's a manuscript version, manuscript source, and it contains one of Francesco's um, richer cards right here, Ricciacata de Francesco. Um, so this is a recording I made, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, I think, 
Uh, and I'll, you know, this is an Italian tablature and I don't know how many people read Italian tablature. So I'll just use my cursor as kind of the bouncing ball as we hear this piece. It goes from here all the way to here. So in conclusion, the act of creating an inclusive and connective network of all musical practices, sung, played, written, and unwritten, quickly reveals flaws in the hierarchies and priorities that have largely mapped the geography of early modern music history. But such charting can also offer the chance for revision. That is to move across the historically constructed and still not outdated boundaries of central and peripheral, style, peripheral styles, greater and lesser composers, singular and plural modes of performance, notated and improvised practices and the border between original compositions and their adaptations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor, for a um, wonderful talk, um, showing us how the sort of disrupting this sort of dichotomy of the center and the periphery and um, revealing to us that um, geography has played a really important role um, in establishing the notion of tradition. So if I may start with the first question. So um, I was curious with, you know, in your three case studies were really fascinating uh, because of how in the case of Francesco do Milano and the other um, Marco do Aquila, you showed how place is very much part of the mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and it also potentially, um, I gather, sort of informs style and even notation perhaps, 
uh, sort of a unif- uh, sort of a uniformity. So I was curious: is there any kind of you know, given that there are instrumental modifications over time and changes in notation? Is there any kind of universalism at all, or does it not really make sense to talk about um, sort of core um, core ways in which you could make connections across time and across place? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, there does seem to be a kind of notion of progress that takes place certainly in, in certain centers in, in Italy. Um, perhaps one model for for a universalism would be um, towards the end of the century when printers begin to, 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 to put together anthologies. And the anthology begins to then bring together works that were, that were popular, that had circulated, that were clearly, um, that, that were clearly consumed at many, many different levels. Um, and these anthologies were very successful and they came out. And I wonder whether that might be uh, where a lot of these composers, you know, receive sort of classic status you know, by being anthologized, similar to, similar, uh, to literature, you know, and how uh, poets and writers become anthologized. Those, anth- those anthologies become, you know, standard reading at, at institutions. And pretty soon that kind of you know, American literature comes into focus. Northern mm-hmm. literature comes into focus. And, and that's how those things become mapped. And so it... Um, we don't pay enough attention, I think, to anthologies, but that's that I think would be one place where I would start with this. Mm. And they're both manuscript anthologies and um, and printed anthologies. The manuscript ones are even more fascinating because now we see a person, an actual person. In this case, the person, one of them that I've studied is a young 17-year-old Florentine who puts in his manuscript works from the early 16th century all the way to some phases of his time. Works to sing, works to play, works to play with his friends. I mean, there's a there's a very interesting aspect of here is my personal personal repertory. Here's my playlist, mm-hmm. right? This is my playlist, and and playlists are are, are good is, is a good analogy because playlists do not sit in one period of time. They are usually they come from various places. They've been they're suggested. They're they're, they're people are tagging it. There's, they're coming in in so many different ways, and your playlist grows in a very interesting fashion. It, these manuscript anthologies are in the case some, somewhat the same thing. Yep. So um, that's, um, yeah, uh, that's intriguing, right? That the anthologies might be the place to kind of track. Uh, so I had another question about sort of the, the center and the periphery, right? And I wondered, um, of course, I've not, I mean, you did not talk about any women composers or uh, women performers. And I, I mean, are they just completely absent from the sort of written record, though they existed, obviously? No, not at all. In fact, okay. you know, in the past few weeks, we've learned about some major discoveries by musicologist Laurie Strauss of um, a whole book of, of, of madrigals um, by uh, a, a very well-known, now well-known female composer. And there are magical composers. The, the problem, there are lots of female lutenists. And uh, in the book that I wrote with Keith Polk, we devote um, uh, some, some time to understanding the issue of gender in, in terms of performance. But professional, professional roots were, were pretty much blocked. Um, right. Where musicians, um, female musicians tend to begin to thrive in the courts of Mantua and Ferrara during the late, late 16th century, um, as, uh, as, as magical singers, virtuoso magical singers. And that was, they about put them on the doorstep to opera in the, in the 17th century. Um, and we have other, um, you know, we know about Isabella d'Este and other women of means who, means who play the lute and compose music. I don't think that I've ever found though a piece that could be securely attributed to a female lutenist. Um, so and, it was not that the uh, that the women were potentially part of the periphery. We're still talking about like a very um, male composer performer, and yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, and the repertories associated with them. You know, courtly repertories right. versus non courtly repertories. Um, you know, for example, you know, we've not other than a, a few people that I think were on the Zoom call. Um, you know, music in, in, for, for, civ, for civic uses, music in cities, um, was not very much studied. A lot of that is improvised. A lot of that is arranged. And when you bring in, in, you know, improv, improvisation and arrangement, those two verbs are fighting words for, for many people because they, they indicate a, a type of music that was what I call evanescent, that was, that's fleeting. 
it's not it's not uh, permanent, um, and uh, and arrangements tend to be considered as uh, corruptions of a um, an or text an or text sure. that that takes it out of the composer's hands. But there's no question that composers understood that their music was going to be arranged, and um, and there are multiple versions of their of their vocal music anyway. So I think the the, the periphery is 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 quite complicated. It's both rural. It's um, classes of musicians who are not elite musicians. Um, they, are, they come from families um, th of that, that have been trumpeters for you know, many generations uh, or lutenists. Um, they are lute makers. You know, there's a huge um, infrastructure of instrument makers that we often don't consider that, you know, especially in Venice. Uh, and so the periphery you know, contains, well, what used to be called the periphery, is called, is called periphery, contains all of that material. Um, and for and instrumental music in general has 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 been relegated to that in in, in, in many ways. Um, may I, like I'm sorry. Go yeah, go ahead, Ty. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question, if I may. Um, I wanted, and please, I'm I'm showing my ignorance here. I had studied flute and piccolo classically uh, for years, but I am ignorant of tablature and you mentioned specifically Italian tablature, so forgive me. Would you explain it a bit more? I, I, it seems to be based more on a, a numbering system. I'm used to more, you know, traditional notes. Yeah, I mean, we, we, still, we still use tablature mm -hmm. um, all the time. If you buy a, you go on the internet and look for, you know, um, the tablatures to Hotel California, you'll get 20 of them all, all wrong. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so let's put up the falaise here. Yeah, this that'd be one, great. This would be the Thank clearest, you. be the clearest one. I was wondering about that. Okay, so this is called French tablature, and the lines that go across from right to left, from left to right, are not staff lines. Those are the strings of the lute. One, two, three, four, five. There's ah. five here, ah. and then he'll put, and then but there are six strings on the lute, so he has to put the letters um, for the for the bottom string below the staff. You can see where my cursor is here. Okay. Right. Okay, so this is the top string of the lute, the, a G, this is a, the second string, a D, here's an A, there's an F, there's a C, and then there's a G down here, which he doesn't indicate, mainly because he used this font and he used this, you know, the blocks for printing for many other uses, and I don't think he had a template for six lines of tablature, so he just did five um, and he, um, figured out the rest. The letters indicate where you put your fingers on the frets, so, oh. so A means that you play the string open. You don't have to fret anything. It's just an open string. B means you put it on the first fret. C means second fret, D, third, et cetera. So when the letters are all piled up, one on top of each other, that's a chord. That means that mm -hmm. that fourth string is open, that D would be the third fret, then you put your finger on the third fret of the third string, and you put your finger on the third fret of the second string, and you, you get actually an F chord. And then he puts the rhythms up here. Now the rhythms only give indication of the fastest voice at any one time. And so um, right here, the fastest voice at any one time is what's going on on the top string. Right? And in other places, like in the piece that I played later, um, we see here. Um, sometimes uh, there, the fastest notes are on the bottom. Okay, so th this is Italian tablature. So Italian tablature reverses everything. Now there's no yeah, I was going to ask about the differences. Thank yeah, you. There's no letters. Now there's numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the A that we saw in French tablature becomes zero. So zero is the open string. And one is the first fret. The second is the second fret. That makes a little bit more right. sense. But that's not the only difference. Now the first string is down here, <laughs> the highest string, and the lowest string is up here. So they reverse that. So you have to kind of, you know, learn both of these tablatures. Then there's German tablature, which assigns a, a unique letter to every single fret and every single note, um, typically. So here's a good example of the lowest voice having you know, all the rhythms. And so you just put the rhythm there and you play all that stuff and then it goes to the tongue. So these, these are tablatures, it's a visual depiction really of right. where you put your fingers. And um, the irony is that tablature was invented to make things easy. So people did not have to read staff notation but it's exactly what has presented this, what has prevented this repertory from being widely known in the musicological literature. And composers, Renaissance composers in particular, would have been conversant in yeah. German, yeah. French, and Italian. No, I don't, I don't think 
anybody outside of Germany was conversant in German tablets. Wow. <laughs> um, and, okay. and that's why and that's why German tablets were faded by the early 17th oh. century. And what was what what was left in the end? Italian tablature kind of fades in the early 18th. What was left was 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 German. It was French. It was French in the end. You know, so very good question. Those are those are good ones. Yeah. Okay. So I actually have another question, which is, so um, so Victor, when when really does the sort of the pattern of patronage, say for lute music, sort of change from the court and the church to more sort of music for the masses, or was that always I there? Think, none of the lutes were music for the masses. I think that there's okay. you know there's it's still the one percent. Okay. You no, know, or the middle class. You know, by uh, the by the 16th century, I I don't think it. Uh, I think the, the the shift from the lute to the to the Spanish guitar. Yeah, there yeah. you're getting because then they're saying you no, know, all the barbers played them, and it becomes very easy to play, and then you get a huge huge um, difference in terms of of class of, of 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 players. But that takes us to the early 17th century, and that's taking place in Spain and in other parts of Italy. Um, so so. Uh, but the lute remains, you know, a, a noble courtly instrument. It's um, it's it remains a, a, a thing for you know well-educated youth. Um, mm. It doesn't seem to have had a a kind of um, association, you know, with brothels or you know the kinds of things that we see with the guitar and and other <laughs> instruments. You know, you look at all the Bruegel painting paintings, you'll never see a lute. You'll see bagpipes and you'll see things like that. But Right. See the, yeah. And and what about um, you know since you are interested in cross cultural musical influences, um, are there versions of the lute that are played around the world? Um, oh, yeah, I mean on the boats in the Indian. Yeah, I mean, so, so that's where it changes. I mean, and and that's another problem with about the, the center and periphery is that you know when I was a graduate student, you would have committed academic suicide by saying that you want to study you know, new world music of, you know, that was exported from, from Spain or what I did in Goa and looking at Portuguese music that ended up in Goa, India. Um, but that is a huge, huge um, trove of information um, that's there. And the first boats that came to India carried instruments. Um, they had small portable organs. Mm, uh, wow. and, and so, so, so that's what led these to the harmonium in right. the end, um, these, these, these organs. Um, and so these these organs that we call portative, um, these tiny small little ones that you can place on a table, which are you can see in many medieval portraits, those are some of the instruments that were used to to accompany chant when they had mass on the boats. I see. And when they came to India and they set up churches, they brought those instruments. Um, probably the English were the ones who uh, were were very influential in the the harm the organ becoming associated with the harmonium, but the harmonium is essentially a, a portative organ. Okay, right. Yeah, and it's probably the only, one of the only fixed pitch instruments in India. All the other ones are, are variable pitch, cars, sarodes, et cetera, bonseries. The, um, you know, but in terms of motifs and actual composition, content of composition and uh, sort of structure, are cross-cultural influences discernible? Like, I mean, did what did you know? Um, did the sort of um, did the mixture of cultures in Spain in the thirteenth, you know, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth centuries with the Moors? Did that actually have impact on these traditions? Yeah, I think that you know when you have, uh, for example, in the New World, New World polyphony, what's interesting is the choice of texts, the liturgical texts that they venerate saints that that were particularly venerated among new Catholics, right? Um, newly baptized Catholics, et cetera, were those are the ones that are chosen, which are very different from the types of saints that you know you might have written texts for in in um, in uh, what about right? the sounds themselves? The sounds themselves. So um, in India, uh, we have a few manuscripts, but they're all from convents. Mm. They're all written for very high voices. Um, right. And so um, and they tend to be all dedicated to Saint Michael. Uh, the protector. So uh, there's <clears throat> there's a lot. So there's that, and whether that <coughs> whether that lets us know about particularly indigenous qualities, it, it's not clear because you know these are written texts that that come from. So the, so the only thing would be the 
the you know the texts themselves, the high voices, um, uh, because they're convents, uh, and um, and we don't have any written record of the um, syncretic music that was very much part of Goa right. um, around the 1560s and 70s before the um, you know the, the 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 Council of Trent and other um, bodies pretty much shut that down, but there was a lot of syncretic music making. And um, the archives show charamelas, which are shams, violas d'arcos, so bowed um, stringed instruments, um, and instruments of the land. And so right. there, was, there was that as well. So there, there would have been, I think, an, a, an indigenous quality to um, music making within these, these institutions, but there's no um, musical record of those, unfortunately. There's no music. I mean, because I mean, I think the so, for example, the Indian oral traditions, uh, musical traditions, you know, seem to have um, appeared quite independently, right? So, right. Carnatic music and yeah. uh, North Indian classical music, right? But the argument is made that you know the forms of music, the forms of North Indian classical music, like the ghazal, right, so on, these are very informed by poetry and Right, these are Urdu Urdu texts that go very 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 far back. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But in, but the, the the problem with it, the the question I always have with Indian music is is, is performance. You know, does Hari Pradhyasya is he playing a style that is a hundred or two hundred years old, or is he playing a style that has somehow been frozen from from four hundred years ago? Right. You know, when. Um, yeah, in, you know, and the argument is when, Krishna, when Krishna played the flute, <laughs> right? I mean, I think the argument is often made, right, when people talk about the difference between Indian classical music and other traditions, is that there isn't as much room for improvisation in the okay. in Indian traditions, right? Where in Indian traditions or outside of Indian traditions? Outside of Indian traditions. Okay, well, that that's exactly what I, I was hoping to, to yeah. thread that that in there. That that's one of the things that has been. Um, that is one of the things that has been eliminated from from uh, from the writings about Renaissance music is that what how do you talk about 15th century instrumental music? I mean, my colleague Keith Polk, who I think is on the call, um, and I devote a fair amount of of, of, of space in, in our most recent book. And you you have to work your way back sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, you have a source that 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 might reflect these traditions, but we have enough theoretical evidence about how they improvised and how they you know, you went from one voice to or two voices to three voices to eventually four voices. Improvisation is 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 a, is a factor that's important all the way through the end of the 18th century. And so, wh while it's it, you know we recognize that now for performance of the 15th and 16th centuries and 17th, we're now starting to um, recognize that for more and more so for performance of the 18th and 19th century music. But no, there's no question that improvisation is that blind spot. Right. In musicology, Renaissance musicology. Right. An unrelated question, Victor. How illustrated were the tablature uh, musical scores? There, there was an earlier, um, I think the first musical piece he paid, played looked like it had um, some illustrations on it. I mean, were these richly illustrated or, or not? Maybe um, some were some, some were the ones that were that were illustrated um, were ones that uh, the 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 owner wanted to keep for posterity. Mm. And so a good example is one that I've, I've just been working on, um, hold on, it's just loading here, uh, that I've just been working on. Hold on. So this, this manuscript is one that I think that you, this is in the Newbury Library. This is a manuscript written by a Venetian, a, 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 a nobleman from, from Brescia. And he had an artist illustrate this manuscript. Oh, wow. So it would, so even if it was lost, if it had become lost, um, somebody would keep it for posterity. Right. And so, but this is unusual. Mm -hmm. um, uh, rarely are Renaissance lute manuscripts um, given to a professional copyist or a scriptorium or an illustrator. This is unusual um, for many reasons. And I've done a study of the images in this book, but this, this might be one of the only ones, you know, 
Uh, there's a few in the 17th century when they were engraved, but as far as manuscripts goes, you can see this is the birth of Adonis, you know, coming out of the tree. <laughs> so there's all these classical references mm. to these things. And they, they tend to be right at the very beginnings of every piece, you know. Um, and then later on, the animals start attacking each other um, oh. and it becomes, and, and you see a lot of these kinds of, um, you know, this, 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 this decoration uh, that that you find um, in Venetian um, Venetian books or ornamented books, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. So there's a strong influence from the Venetian arabesques, I think, is what what they're called um, from that tradition. Yeah. Good. Good oh, question. Yeah. This is gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really gorgeous. So um, I feel bad that we've been monopolizing the entire time for questions. So let's. <laughs> Let's wait and see if there are any uh, questions from the audience. Uh, please go ahead and type them um, in the Q&A. And, and um, you know, I mean, I, I could keep asking, trying to understand. This stuff is so, so fascinating. Um, so I guess while we wait for someone up, uh, else to muster up uh, uh, courage to type up a question, um, I mean, I would like to sort of uh, continue. Um, so how, I mean, you showed a lot of these manuscripts, right? So what, you know, in, in modern day music, what do you think, how should we preserve our musical traditions now? Well, they're all digital. Right, and so they are- are you, are you talking about how do you preserve the actual, um, the actual item or preserve the tradition, say a, a tradition that in a, in a village that's rapidly being modernized or something like that? Both, I mean, both really, right? I mean, you have a recording that is digital, yeah. but the text, the, uh, the actual musical scoring of it and so on, I mean, just scanned copies. I mean, the, you know, vellum has survived quite well. Yeah, right? but it's not, of... not, not much anymore. I mean, I think that the large collections in Europe have been on a project of digitizing now for 20 years. And during the pandemic, it was remarkable to see how I could continue my work by, by being able to get complete full text manuscripts from most of the major, major libraries. And um, you know, there's an enormous amount of government funding. I've just signed off as a reviewer for a, a very large one in Germany. Um, that's probably the largest one that I've ever seen. Uh, with the Austrian National Library in tow and things like that, but that that is a way. And those things are searchable. You know, you can. There's a lot of metadata. There's tagging, and so that it's easy to 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 burn through those those collections. Um, you know, with with questions and try to find stuff. So in that sense, it's it's very good to have those digitized because for analytical work, it becomes it becomes much much easier. Um, uh, yeah, but in the in the day, I mean, I looked at every single one of these manuscripts <clears throat> by hand, and most of my colleagues did too. There was nothing, there's no other way to do it, or you, you looked at it on microfilm. But those those days are over. As far as the musical traditions themselves, I mean, the older older um, history of ethnomusicology was that you would try to preserve these traditions, but by, but by, by preserving them, you're also recording them, and you're you're creating a kind of intrusion. I mean, Alan Lomax recorded all of those blues musicians in the South, country blues players, and ethnomusicologists went to Bali, they went to, to India, recorded and recorded. Um, and then as tourism encroaches, and you see some of these villages now stopping to play music, and, their mu and those musicians who played village music are now playing in the hotels. Right. You, know, you, you know, you could decry that and say, well, this is so disappointing. But what you're seeing is a transformative aspect of how music is being transformed. Go is another great example. You know, the the, the whole coastline is dotted uh, with with uh, five star hotels, right. and you go in there and you find um, people singing in um, uh, singing in Konkani, you yep. know, uh, traditional Konkani songs, you know, for tourists. Um, and the, the the interest now is how those things have changed from early recordings. You know, what we're finding out is in in places that play. Um, gamelan instruments and things like that, all these hotel players are playing much faster than they ever had before because they've got to fit it in from the people when they arrive on the bus where they're stopped at the hotel to have, you know, some uh, some food and hear the, the show and then go back on the bus to the next event. Right. So everything has been transformed. So in a sense, the ethnomusicologist is saying, let it die, you know, and 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 see how it see how it plays itself out. 
Right, and see what remains as a residue. Right, right. Rather than the old uh, Alan Miriam con the con concept of you know the, the knight on the white horse who's going to come in and record and save everyone. Right. That's the the white knight theory. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think, Ty, did you have any last questions before we wrap up? I was curious, I'm not sure if this is uh, historically correct, but what from what you presented flourished most uh, in the new world when it was founded? What kind of made it over? Were there, were there any well, uh, I, I, traditions okay, so, that... So in, in, well? in, in India, they, bought, they brought books of chant the early explorers brought books of chant because they needed to celebrate mass on on the ship and when they got there and they built a very early church in saint catherine's which still exists with you know crumbling um in old goa um by 1540 uh they were bringing in um polyphony so this is chant now with another voice i don't know what kind is probably very simple two voice polyphony and they have a word for it um, you know, canto d'organo, you know, uh, singing over the organ, um, so two voices, versus canto shang, which is chant. So that's a big development there. Um, by the 17th century, mainstream Jesuit music, because the Jesuits were in Goa, um, mainstream Roman Jesuit music from the Roman College is being sung in Goa. Wow. Mainstream. Mm -hmm. Going the other way, um, there's a very large, large, two very large collections in, in Mexico City that are late 16th, early 17th century um, mainstream music, but also containing some composers that were trained in Mexico, some of the indigenous composers that were trained in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's, and that's, that's been a very important source for study. Uh, so we're, so, so it's, there is a lot of travel, um, but all this, all this kind of music, all of it required extensive training. Right. And training requires an extensive commitment of resources. And so, and, and in a sense, in the end, you know, the, for, as far as India, the, the, the Christian project really did not, did not survive. I mean, the Christian, did not take off really. Right yeah, now. it didn't, it didn't really. All the letters that Xavier sent back to, to, to Rome saying that, you know, he had baptized 10,000 people, you know, on the coast and things like that. He went to Kerala and baptized another 5,000. Those were all exaggerations. We do have one question in the Q&A, if I may read it out. Yeah. Uh, was there any music related to specific events, historical figures, or memories that people could interpret in their own ways? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of music that's that was written for specific events. These would be what we have, you know, our, you know, um, large events, institutional events, you know, coronations, Christians. weddings, et cetera, weddings and things like that. We, yeah, we do see um, that music begin to then trickle down into the hands of, uh, of, um, of domestic musicians. So, so that's, a, that's a good point. And a, one example would be Medici festival music, these enormous pageant, you know, celebrations with tons of pageantry, which went on for weeks and weeks at a time, when one of the Medici married somebody from, you know, the Habsburg Empire or from the, you know, the French Empire or whatever. But um, eventually that music began to trickle down. Uh, and I've traced a little bit of how it was, but it got into the hands of domestic players, people who were probably connected, you know, seven degrees of separation from the court. Um, and then that music was arranged. And some of that music, you know, which was originally for four voices, now appears for, um, for one voice and lewd accompaniment. So that's what that's what actually happens. So, th so that is a transformation, a personal transformation of a, a, a of a work for that person's own use. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, we should probably not uh, detain you any longer. And uh, thanks once again, Victor, for Thank a you. wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, so um, I'll, we, I'll see you uh, in May. Yes. Yeah, I'll see you in May and um, really looking forward to when we can welcome you to campus. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you very much. And thank everyone for, for, for listening. Thank you, Victor. Thank, thank you. Hi. I also want to say thanks to uh, Dr. Tai Camp and Brian McCoy for helping us with the recording. And the recording should be available online uh, uh, fairly uh, in short order within a week or so. so. Great. Thank thanks. you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Victor. Bye.